Amen. Thank you for your good singing. You can be seated. And I discovered as I was sitting on the platform that I've been a bad scribe, and that is I did not update the title for our study this evening. We are in the book of Genesis, and we are going to be in Genesis 25, but we are now done with the parts of Genesis that deal with Abraham. We're now beginning a short section that deals with his two greatest sons, his first son, the illegitimate son, Ishmael, and then his greater son, Isaac. So if you wanted to rename this evening's study instead of calling it the Path of the Patriarch, we'll call this the Saga of the Son. It'll, this saga will take us through chapters 25 and 26. We're going to find in the verses we'll read in a little bit a lot of places that will be named, and it's funny how places get named and renamed and named back again to what they were. I always wondered how in the world the town where our church used to be, the uh, other half of our church used to be, how in the world did we get a name like Buena Park? English, Spanish, no, the other way around, Spanish, English. How did that happen? I researched it and found out that the name came from a uh, natural spring that was at the corner of Artesia Boulevard and Beach Boulevard. And they built a park there, a plaza, Buena Plaza the good park. And uh, property changed hands from the Dons, Don Coyote, uh, passed down to various people and eventually landed in the hands of gringos. And uh, for whatever reason, they decided to throw in an English name into the Spanish name, and Buena Park was born at some time in the 1800s. They started using, late 1800s, started using that name. We're going to look this evening at some stories of Isaac where he's treading over the same land that his father Abraham had treaded over and he has to redo some of the things that his father did. Has to redig some of the same wells. And sometimes he ends up having to rename them, giving them their old names back or sometimes slightly different names. And we're also sadly going to see that Isaac does some things that his father did foolishly over again. And it's going to stand to us as a testimony to the failure to learn from previous generations. Israel, as they read these stories, as they heard these stories from the mouth of Moses for the first time, would be struck by how much they were like Abraham and Isaac, both good and bad as recipients of the promise that had been given. Well, I've given you a handout this evening that has a chart on the first page and on the back side is a, is a map. And I want to remind you uh, that the book of Genesis breaks up into uh, ten parts. There are ten records. The first four deal with the earliest history. We could call that primeval history. And they all begin with something like this. These are the generations of so-and-so or of such-and-such. Ten times that punctuates the book. The, the first four of those deal with the creation and how it fell, and then Adam's race and Noah's flood and then Noah's sons. And then the next six deal with the history of the patriarchs. Patriarchal history, we could call it. The early fathers of Israel's past. There are six of those. And the first one is the, a brief one about the sons of Shem, Noah's good son. And then we just finished recently going through chapters 11 through 25, Abraham's story. This evening, we'll look very briefly at a short segment about Ishmael his first son, though his illegitimate son. And then there's a section about Isaac's story. That is, the story of Isaac is going to wrap into itself not only him, but also his boys, Jacob and Esau. So we'll begin looking at that this evening and focusing mostly upon the story involving Isaac. But briefly, I want us to come to chapter 25, verse 12, and you can look on your chart that's over on the left side, and it says the third record, and that means the third record in this second half of the book. If you're doing math, this puts you up at the seventh great record uh, total in the book. And this is a very, very short one about Ishmael's descendants. Do you see how short that is? What is that, seven verses? One of the ten great segments of the book is seven Verses, ha, huh. short. But you know, this is the way the, the book of Genesis flows. It starts off with a long segment and then a short one, and a long segment and a short one. And then as we come into the second half of the book, it's short, 
long, very short, very long. <laughs> Another short one and a very long one to end out the book. Not a whole lot to be said about Ishmael. Yes, someone who God would bring some, have some use for and promise to protect him, but he is not the promised line. His descendants are descendants of Abraham who are outside of the covenant. They're not part of this special plan. They fit into the larger plan of God, but not this special plan to raise up one nation in the earth that would become a source of blessing to all the other nations of the earth. There's a heading about this in chapter 25, verse 12. Now these are the records of the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's maid, bore to Abraham. And then we're told, uh, listed out for us in verses 13 through 16, the 12 sons of Ishmael. Now we uh, know in the Old Testament there's a lot said about the 12 sons of Israel. This will be Israel is another name for Abraham's grandson. And the, uh, that 12-ness looms large over the Bible. There's 12, actually there's 13. It's a baker's dozen. There's 13 tribes, aren't there? There are 12 that have land, and then there's the tribe of Levi. That looms large over the Old Testament. Then we come to the New Testament, and as the, as the Lord Jesus begins to redeem a people to himself, I think it's significant that he chooses for himself 12 apostles plus one, right? Paul, we have that baker's dozen. Again, that's the line. That's the physical line, and then, if you will, the spiritual line that the Lord uses. But here's another line of 12, of which very little will be said in the Bible. The Ishmaelites are hardly ever mentioned. Mostly, when they're mentioned, it's about someone in their tribe marrying someone else from the Edomite tribe or something like that. But they're not, it's not that God has no care for them. It's not that they're unimportant to God at all, but they're not in the line of the plan. So verses 13 through 16 list them out, and I'll read through this with little comment. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names in the order of their birth. Nebaioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kedar, and Abdael, and Mibsam, and Mishma, and Duma, and Masa, Hadad, and Tama, Yatur, Napish, and Kedama. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages and by their camps, twelve princes according to their tribes. Uh, I want to pause for a moment to say that it, it has been very popular for a long time to say that the Arabs of the modern world are the descendants of Ishmael. Uh, the Arab, particularly the Muslim Arab world, loves to make that claim. Um, it is largely not true. Uh, the Arab world is an amazingly complicated mix of many different ethnicities who have uh, come together over the centuries. There is a, a small percentage, perhaps, of Arabs who could, who could, if they could, trace themselves back to Ishmael. There are no genealogical records available to do such a thing. Um, but it is true, nonetheless, that the sons of Ishmael in the Old Testament times would become a source of contention for Israel, as par particularly when they intermarried with the other enemies of the Israelite line. There's a list of 12 names, and each of those 12 names also corresponds to places. And I, I didn't provide it for you on the, uh, on the map, but many of these names, these uh, fathers of various tribes, would found places in uh, Arabia, as well as in uh, moving down into what we now call Sudan and Ethiopia. Um, now, over time, their tribes would move and go to different places, so it's difficult to say, well, where are these tribes today? In fact. Uh, we really don't know. It's fascinating that, the, that Israel as an ethnic people group is clearly defined and distinguished. And yet so many of the other peoples of the world have a very, very hard time to sniff one out. Twelve sons, but not the twelve sons. We're told then in verses 17 and 18 about Ishmael's death and the controversial settlement of his descendants. I say controversial because these descendants of Ishmael who were kind of smarted by what had happened to their 
their patriarch, what had happened to Ishmael, would be settled around the regions where Israel would be moving. And they would become a source of conflict, especially as they intermingled with other peoples for the children of Israel for a long, long time. We're told in verse 17 of chapter 25, now these are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. That phrase, by the way, gathered to his people, could mean a couple of things. Some, some have thought that this is a reference to the burial practices where families were buried together in the same cave. That may be, although archaeologists tell us that that was not so much a custom until some centuries later. Uh, it might simply be a reference to he passed on to the other side, to Sheol, the place of the dead where his relatives were, regardless of whether it be what we call heaven or hell. He passed on to the other side as... Uh, as his other relatives had, including Abraham. And then in verse 18, they settled from Havilah to Shur, which is east of Egypt, as one goes down toward Assyria. He settled in defiance of all his relatives. I'm going to make a change to your translation there. As one goes towards Assyria, actually it's literally as one goes towards Ashur, and there are a couple different places in the Bible named Ashur. Assyria, modern-day Iraq, is the most famous one, but there is another one uh, as well that's here in the Sinai. So the wilderness of Shur, you can see on the map here, is to the east uh, of Egypt. And uh, so somewhere in this northern Sinai peninsula, this is where many of these uh, these descendants of his settled and then they would migrate down south I can't show you on the map because I didn't copy it but there, is a, there are two Havilahs there's one way down at the tip of Ethiopia which might suggest that the descendants of Ishmael settled south there's also another one far over on the east side of Saudi Arabia near Yemen so uh, it's hard to know exactly, Did, are we talking about going from Egypt all the way over to Yemen? Or are we talking about going from Egypt all the way down to Ethiopia? Whichever it is, the point is that they've settled far and wide. They have quite a bit of uh, representation in different parts of the world. The Lord had promised that though he was not the chosen one, that a great nation would come from him, but also that he would be kind of an uncontrollable man. And there'd be a lot of tension between his descendants and the descendants of the godly line of Abraham. And we see within this listing, this brief listing, that, you know, our, our actions have consequences. The folly of Abraham in siring that child with Hagar, who was not his legitimate wife, it brought grief not only within his marriage, it brought grief not only to Hagar and to Ishmael, it brought grief to their descendants for a long, long, long time. Some sins that we commit, though there may be forgiveness in God's grace, some sins sow a lot of seed that produce a lot of weeds. Forgiveness does not eliminate the principle of sowing and reaping. Whatever a man sows that shall he also reap. And the reaping sometimes comes a lot later, and the reaping, you know how that works, seed is little, but produce is big. And behold the consequences of folly. And how we ought to learn, and how Israel needed to learn, so also we need to learn. to Think about, especially those great moral failures. And again, Abraham was forgiven. Abraham was justified by faith, by the grace of God. But there were ongoing, lingering consequences of leaning on his own understanding. Well, this is almost all that's said about the descendants of Ishmael in Egypt. There'll be a few uh, of, uh, in Genesis, rather. There'll be a few more things said later on. But now we come to chapter 25, verse 19, and the storyline refocuses on the major line. So we're now in the, the fourth major record. Uh, of the second half of the book or if you're doing math this is the eighth one in the entire book of Genesis this is on Isaac's family and how the covenant will be continued through Isaac and then down through Jacob there's yet more controversy to come because there's going to be a split between Isaac's sons Abraham had a split between his sons Isaac will have a split between his sons and the repercussions of that will last for generations to generations 
Well, this fourth record breaks up into uh, a number of parts, and um, tonight we're going to be looking at the rest of chapter 25 and then move into chapter 26. Let's move over more toward your left there, and you'll see here in chapter 25, verses 19 to 34, the early drama of Jacob and Esau. I'm not going to say very much about this right now because I intend this to be the segment that I preach next on Sunday mornings. This is the portion where Esau stupidly, foolishly, sells his birthright for a bowl of soup. And he becomes a byword within the Jewish world and even within the New Testament of those who give away what's most important for that which is most passing. But before we get to that sad story, there's the, the story of the birth of these rival twins in verses 19 to 26. We have a, a heading about this new segment of the book in, in the beginning of verse 19. Now, these are the records of the generations of Isaac. Abraham's son. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, of Padamaran, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. We looked at that story in previous weeks. Um, Here is just recounting where Rebekah had come from. She was a, a, a relative of sorts, and verse 21 continues, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife, because she was barren. Oh my, doesn't this sound familiar? Abraham and Sarah, 75 and 65 years old, living outside the land, we're told you're gonna have a, you're gonna have a nation, and it's gonna start with a son. She'd been, they'd been trying for decades and couldn't have a child, and it would be 25 more years before the Lord would open her womb. Here's a similar test for Isaac. The Lord had clearly brought Rebekah and Isaac together, very clearly. The longest chapter in Genesis celebrates how they're getting together. And now they're barren. We'll read in a few verses that they were married for 20 years before they had children. Uh, something fascinating here in verse 21 Isaac prayed to the Lord that word prayed is not the normal word for prayer it's a very rare word in fact it's a word that's often associated with sacrifice it seems like he's doing something more extraordinary than just in his daily devotions I, and I don't know if uh, I don't know if Isaac knew anything about the notion of devotions as we have it but uh, this is something more than that uh, this is something significant. This is on par with uh, you know, building an altar to the Lord. This is something rather monumental. And we'll find that his wife will do something similar as well in the, in the verse to come. He prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife. The Lord answered him, Rebekah conceived. Now look with me down in verse 22 to 26, and we see the battle to be first between these boys begins even before they are born. Verse 22, but the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it is so, why then am I this way? Which means, if this is the way it's going to be, why am I even pregnant? Now, some, some ladies have easy pregnancies. Some ladies have fascinatingly hard pregnancies. Some ladies have it so easy they don't even know they're pregnant until a child comes. That is not this. this. These are extraordinary complications. And she's wondering, am I going to give birth? No, that doesn't feel like birth. What in the world is going on there inside the womb? And she's starting to wonder if maybe her husband shouldn't have gone to all the trouble he did to pray like he did and make the sacrifice perhaps that he did to get the Lord to answer this request. So look what the end of verse 22 says. So she went to inquire of the Lord. That is an extraordinary statement on a number of hands. That phrase is used elsewhere in the Old Testament to talk about kings going to a prophet to get a word from God about what's taking place. It's used of David, it's used of Hezekiah, it's used sometimes in the prophets. So it's not uncommon in the Old Testament, but at this point in the Old Testament, that is really uncommon. And it raises so many questions. Where did she go to do this? We do know earlier on in Genesis that there are some 
who know the Lord apart from the line of Abraham. Remember that guy, that strange man who appears out of nowhere in chapter 16, the king of Salem, what's his name? Melchizedek, priest of the Most High God. And you, the text says that to us and we think, really? Where did he come from? Nice guy. Are there more of you? And apparently there are. Not many. But she went to make inquiry and she receives a response. And we're told in verse 23, the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. The battle for supremacy had already begun. Um, I don't want to say too much more. I just realized I'm stealing thunder from next week's sermon. Uh, Verse 24, when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, Now the first came forth red, all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau, red. Afterward, his brother came forth with his hand holding onto Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob, and Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. Then there's that sad, sad story that I, I won't even walk through the outline with you, verses 27 to 34. It begins by talking about the differences and divisions that existed within the family, and that becomes the, the little bit of a rift that gives way for this terrible situation where Esau gives away some of his rights of inheritance to his brother for something so temporary. Verse 27, when the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. Now Isaac loved Esau because he had taste for game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. When Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. And he said to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I'm famished. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, well, I'm about to die. So what use is it then of birthright to me? And Jacob said, first, swear to me. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. And he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Oh, I want to say a lot, but I'm going to hold it. (laughs) Well, let's move on to the next segment. Chapter 26. Chapter 26 is about a conflict between Isaac and Abimelech. Does that sound vaguely familiar to you? Chapter 21. Abraham had a conflict with a man named Abimelech, living in the same place. Here we are again, like father, like son, and not always in the best ways, but sometimes in the best of ways. This is a section about Isaac's failure and the Lord's faithfulness. There are tensions between Abimelech that result in a covenantal resolution. Let's look now at uh, chapter 26, uh, let's see. Now I think I missed. I must have dropped out a couple. Oh, there we are. Yeah, over on the left. There's a famine in the land. This is the background to this. Uh, the famine in the land, verses one through seven, tells about us, and it's kind of like the same things that his father had been through. Abraham went through at least two periods of great famine that forced him to move and migrate in different places. Here's another patriarchal famine, and the sojourn at Gerar. Verse 1 of chapter 26, Now there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. Now I'm going to scroll down to the map and show you a little bit of where this is. Um, You can see it on your backside. Now I've circled Beersheba, which which is a place of 
a lot of activity of Abraham and his descendants. Gerar is over there to the east, to the west rather, in the Philistine plain. The reason why this region seems to be not so affected, uh, whereas places like Beersheba, and the, the further south you go, the more deserty it gets. But Gerar, here on the Philistine plain, that is built on a riverbed, basically, what's called a wadi. It's a dry river. It only, it only floods in the seasonal rains. But the table water is much higher in places like that. So it's, even if there's a famine, even if there's a drought, you can drill down more easily and get water. So that's what brings Isaac and all of his flocks and his agro-business to move over into the, the realm of this king. The promised land is not looking so promising right now, is it? But you know, this has happened before. What happened shortly after Abraham came into the promised land? There was a famine in the land, and the Lord directed him to go down to Egypt and then brought him out, just like he would bring his descendants out of Egypt again. Well, here's an assurance from the Lord to Isaac that the promised land is still full of promise, that the land covenant that had been made with his father is true for him as well. This time, though, he tells him to avoid Egypt and remain in the promised land in verse 2. The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land of which I shall tell you. And he reaffirms now the covenant that had been made with his father in verses 3 through 5. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. Now, again, that word sojourn means to live here as an immigrant. Legal immigrant, yes, but um, you're not going to buy land. You're not going to build houses. You're going to live in tents but I will be with you. I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants, I will give all these lands and I will establish the oath which I swore, which I swore to your father Abraham. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and will give your descendants all these lands and by your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed." Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. I just realized now your handout has a mistake. Verse 6 is not about Isaac's obedience. This is about Abraham's obedience. Abraham had demonstrated himself one who believed God, and it was credited him as righteousness. And the covenant goes on now to his son. And the idea, by bringing up his father's faith and faithfulness, Isaac, you be faithful too, and you will come to experience this as well. Now, in one sense, the promise that God made to Abraham is what's called a unilateral covenant. That is, God guarantees by himself to bring it to pass. But there were still conditions to that covenant. The conditions were not whether or not God was going to keep his word or not. The conditions were, if you will believe me and walk in my ways, then you will be among the generations that enjoy the blessings of this promise. And so it will come about in the end of the age when our Lord Jesus comes again, that there will be a generation of Jews who will finally believe him and trust him and will so inherit the land when he comes again. By mentioning his father's obedience, he desires Isaac to demonstrate obedience too. And yet the very next verse, verse 7, we see Isaac's lack of faith and some deceptive self-protection. Chapter 26, verse 7. Uh, <coughs> when the men... Uh, I'm sorry, I, I skipped a little bit. Uh, verse 6, so Isaac lived in Gerar. In verse 7, one of the men of the place asked about his wife. He said, she's my sister. <laughs> For he was afraid to say, my wife, thinking the men of the place might kill me on account of Rebekah, for she is beautiful. Now this is pa, deja vu all over again, isn't it? Um, how many times did Abraham do something like this? Twice. 
Shortly after he came down the land, he went down to Egypt, and Pharaoh saw how beautiful Sarah was and decided to bring her into his harem. And Abraham made kind of a half lie. He said, well, she's my sister. She actually was a half-sister. But again, there's some sort of thinking, and it's a little bit unclear to us exactly how this all works out, but somehow they're thinking, uh, you know, if they, if they just kill me, then they can have her outright. If, if she's not claimed, then maybe I can work some other way out of this. That might have been the reasoning. And he does that with Pharaoh, and then years later, he does it again in the same place, in Gerar with Abimelech. Um, it, may, it may not be the same Abimelech, by the way. Uh, Abimelech is a title. It, it means father of a king. It's a dynastic name. It's kind of like Caesar would become a name that each uh, emperor would, would have after that. It might be the son or the grandson of the Abimelech that Abraham had dealt with, or maybe it's, maybe it's the exact same one, but it certainly is the exact same lack of faith that Isaac is demonstrating. So now here come the tensions with Abimelech. We see um, Isaac's dishonesty and Philistia's jealousy. The, there's the discovery of his dishonesty in, uh, in verse 8, it came about when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out through a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was caressing his wife, Rebekah. Now, this word caressing is something like um, having fun with, uh, joking with, it's used sometimes. So the idea, there was some kind of a banter, there was some sort of a play, you know, siblings play together and play pranks on each other, but the way these little games ended was not brother-sister relations. You know, after whatever they were doing, it ended with a kiss instead of, you know, a punch. And it didn't take too many eyes to recognize, no, they are not siblings. So his dishonesty is discovered, and look at Abimelech's outrage in verse 9, an outrage which will give way to a protective injunction. Uh, in verse 9, then Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, certainly she is your wife. How then did you say she is my sister? And Isaac said to him, Because I said I might die on account of her. Oh, what a man. Abimelech said, What is this you've done to us? One of our people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech charged all the people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. It's interesting, the three stories we've had so far of this kind of thing, there, there's sort of a progression. Back when Abraham did this with Pharaoh, with his wife and Pharaoh, Pharaoh discovers it because of a dream the Lord gives him, and Pharaoh just kicks them out. And then it happened some years later with Abraham and Sarah and Abimelech. And Abimelech is kind of outraged, and Abimelech gives them a bunch of money and kicks them out. And now we have Abimelech and Isaac's wife. This is happening again. And this time, there's actually a law passed, an edict, a protection against them. It's as if the, the, the even though this, this mistake is repeated again and again, there, there's obviously the, the mark of God's favor on them and protecting them to spite themselves. How merciful of God. And they see, the Philistines see the blessing of, of the Lord on Isaac, and they start to envy it in verses 12 through 14. Now Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him, and he became rich and continued to go richer until he became very wealthy, for he had possession of flocks and herds and a great household so that the Philistines envied him. So that then leads to the eviction of Isaac, beginning in verse 15. Uh, there's a, a, an older problem that's brought up here, verse 15. Now all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines stopped up by filling them with earth. Abraham had traveled many, many miles throughout the land, and apparently here in the valley of Gerar, he had dug wells. And, you know, they wouldn't stay there forever. They would move on to someplace else. And the Philistines apparently had decided, we don't want too many migrant farming companies coming through here. So they plugged up 
the wells. This is a complication of, that had already existed. And then on top of that, Isaac is ousted by royal order in verses 16 and 17. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you're too powerful for us. And Isaac departed from there and camped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. The valley of Gerar is just further out from the city where he had been. And the quarreling continues. We come now to verses 18 to 33. Conflict continues over well water. And, but then there's this wonderful thing where, where the Lord renews his covenant with Isaac and Abimelech renews covenantal relationships with Isaac. But first we have the continuing conflict over the water wells in verses 18 to 22. Isaac sets out to restore the wells that his father had dug in verse 18. Then Isaac dug again the wells of, of water which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the same names which his father had given them. But then the Philistines decide to confiscate two of them. Verse 19, But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of flowing water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with the herdsmen of Isaac, saying, The water is ours. And this term for quarrel is often used in legal context. They were pressing their claims back in the royal city. So he named the well Essek conflict, quarrel, because they contended with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over it too, so he named it Sitna, opposition. <laughs> he moved away from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it, so he named it Rehoboth, which means broad place. For he said, at last the Lord has made room for us, and we will be fruitful in the land. I grew up, if you travel in the south and southeast, you'll find periodically churches named things like Rehoboth Baptist Church or whatever. And it's usually some story about we didn't know where we were going to build, but the Lord made room for us. Uh, I grew up as a kid going to a place in Delaware called Rehoboth Beach, which was originally set up as a church campground where churches would gather for prayer meetings and revival meetings, and the Lord had made a place. Here, there's a, a bit of respite. Finally, he's not being pursued around in that valley. He still needs to stay in the valley. The, apparently, the famine is still going on. He needs that high well water. And then, verse 23, there's this encouraging word from the Lord. Yes, Isaac, you're having trouble. You're being chased around. Conflict is following you, but I am still with you. Verse 23, then he went up from there to Beersheba, just a little bit to the southeast. The Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. Now, the name Beersheba, where he was, means well of seven. You might remember that story, that when Abimelech and Abraham had finally had a peace treaty made, that Abraham gave him seven ewe lambs, and the well that was dug there was called the well of the seven. And ironically, the word for seven also rhymes with the word for oath. So it was kind of a double entendre. Here he comes back to that place where the Lord had shown grace to his father and the Lord's going to show him grace there again. And then we have the offer of peace from Abimelech. It doesn't look so peaceful when Abimelech shows up in verses 26 and 27 with his forces. Verse 26, Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar with his advisor Ahuzath and Phicol, the commander of his army. Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me? Since you hate me and have sent me away from you. But then look at the conf his confession of Yahweh's blessing. And then following that, the celebration of a peace covenant. Verse 28, they said, we see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, let there now be an oath between us, even between you and us. And let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm, just as we have not touched you and have, uh, have done to you nothing but good and have sent you away in peace. Now you are blessed of the Lord. Then he made them a feast, and they ate and drank. In the morning they arose early and exchanged oaths. 
Then Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. And then we have the happy conclusion in verse 32 to 33. There's more water to be found at Beersheba. Now it came about on the same day that Isaac's servants came in and told him about the well which they had dug and said to them, We have found water. So he called it Sheba. That's like Bear Sheba. It's the same name. Uh, Sheba, again, depending on how you say it, it means oath or it means seven. Therefore, the name of the city is Bear Sheba to this day. He had to rename the place his father had named. Isn't it interesting? Apparently, they had been there for a while. They migrated away. And, you know, after a while, when you're not there anymore, and there's not like a sign they put up outside the well, this is Bear Sheba. You know, so names get lost, and now it gets reclaimed. Two wells now, remembering these covenants, that a peace that had been made. The God who had made a covenant with them brought about these smaller covenants to bring them a measure of peace in their sojourn. You know, that's, that's often the way it works with us in the Lord. We have a great covenant of peace that the Lord has made with us through the gospel. We have entered into the new covenant of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are more blessings of that yet to come, but we, we have this new relationship with him, and, and the final promises are great and majestic, but along the way, the Lord in his kindness blesses us and favors us with answers to prayer with demonstrations of his grace with his sovereignly turning around events so that we can see the good hand of God those victories you have in your home um, in your work experience those uh, those successes you have in sharing the word and seeing people come to faith those are all these tokens of the good hand of God and Isaac was supposed to be encouraged by that the biggest thing he was to hold on was the promise of God itself But it's very encouraging when you see the hand of the Lord at work. And you know, the more we focus on the great promises the Lord has made to us in the gospel, the more attuned we are to see the good things that come to us as well through him. What did the Apostle Paul say? He said, he who spared not his own son, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? He's given us the best thing. So we ought not be surprised when in his grace he grants us lesser things. Well, there's just two last verses I'll mention very quickly. It's, these are verses of transition, and it's going sideways on your chart. The two verses that set us up for the conflicts that are about to happen with Esau and, uh, and Jacob. Verse 34 says, When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Be'ri, the Hittite, and Basamoth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, Oh, Esau, there you go, multiplying the wives. And they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. This man, Esau, we'll learn more about him next week. And a man fueled by his passions led him into grief and brought the whole family into grief. And really, many of the next chapters, chapters 27 to 33, are going to be chapters of conflict between Jacob and Esau. You know, the things we do have impact not only on us, they impact others. They impact whole families. They impact whole nations. How much better it is to align ourselves with the plan of God and throw ourselves upon the mercy that he freely gives to us. Well, would you join me, please, in prayer as we conclude this evening? Father, we're glad that we've had time to survey these uh, stories of old, stories which are rich in their significance, not only to the Israelites who read them at first millennia ago, but on to us now. As we see these patterns of, of sin repeated, we marvel, and yet we ought not to marvel, for we know that that same propensity lies within us. And as we see your grace repeated again and again, that really does cause us to marvel because it is a wonder that you are so kind and so faithful when we are so often so fickle. So Lord, make us more like yourself, faithful in covenant, keeping true to what we have pledged and said, and know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is there to enable us to do all the things you've called us to. In the name of Christ, we ask it all.